When I think about the strategic way that that black people have been, the idea of what cool black looks like in the media and how the media has taken that. If we really, if, if let, let's just assume, let's play like a hypothetical-ish game where if we really believe that we are being systemically or systematically op oppressed, right? Would it not make sense that the most powerful communication mechanism in media is also strategically leveraging that platform to oppress us without us necessarily even knowing? Not to be a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. What I'm saying is that if we really believe that the system is broken and we understand the power of media, the power of video, the power of communications, the reach of all of these things, would it not make sense that the people who are oppressing us might be using the most powerful communication mechanism to continue to do that? What, what do I mean by that? Why am I saying that? There's, there's this thing where humans, we, we live off of association. Like this is, um, this is a survival mechanism for us. It's, it's a way that we can digest the world and understand the world is association. However, what ends up happening is now we understand also the influence of hip hop, et cetera. And I think what media has done is we understand like in a lot of ways, like the, the drug influence, gang influence within, within hip hop culture as well. So what they ended up kind of doing was it wasn't just about that lifestyle, but it, they also associated an outcome with that lifestyle, right? Where we associate it with money, we associate it with women, we associate it with sex, we associate it with cars. You have a lot of just people who aren't necessarily drug dealers who see this style. It's like, okay, that actually looks pretty stylish. That looks pretty cool, right? Like that's a, that's a good outfit. But then they're all saying, oh, and it's also associated with things that are universally cool. Money, women, cars, okay. We're not thinking like, oh, I wanna be like this drug dealer or whatever. It's just kinda like, oh, this style is associated with some really positive things. So what ends up happening is you have a certain group of people that are associating style with something that's really negative. And then you have a certain group of people that's associating that same style with something positive. And then now there's this process of saying, hey, if you see me, how can I disassociate you from understanding or thinking about, hey, this style is something associated with negative, whereas me, I just like this style. How can I disassociate your, your preconceived notion about what that certain style means? And I don't think that's something that a lot of immigrants may have been able to do. And also I don't think that white people may have been able to do it, but I also think it's very strategically done to create this type of confusion within our community. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't think there's a way to dissociate it, which is why many people, because even if we can, can recognize as other black people, because they talk about it the same way with music, like with song lyrics, like we're not all listening to songs and being influenced by what they're saying. Some of us just like the song. Some of us just like, like the beat, what it's, we're not paying attention to, we're not being influenced by what they're saying. But there are, uh, there is a population within the community that would be influenced by that and would associate, hey, for me to get on, for me to get this deal, we, we talk about like Kanye and Drake and how much pushback they got when they first came out. People were, I remember because, you know, I'm an influence. I, I was, uh, what do you call? Um, you groupie? Early adopter <laughs> oh, oh. to I Drake you meant, I thought you meant groupie. back when his like mixtape came out like forever ago. And so when the mixtape came out, I remember talking to my coworkers and they were all like, you know, dudes from the city. Like they were into, I forget who was hot at the time, but like I like Dipset and you know, all that other stuff. And when they were like, yo, I kept telling them like, yo, you gotta listen to this mixtape. Listen to like, yo, Drake is dope, Drake is dope. And they were like, mm, Canada, nah, like this dude had no credibility, right? And then when people actually listened to him, obviously he caught on, he's still around. Like Kanye, the same thing, struggled to, because he wasn't in within the drug culture and was, didn't have, wasn't talking about guns and all these other things. Like it was such a foreign concept at the time that you could rap about something else other than, and he kind of honestly did 
fall into the lane of talking about money and women and all of that stuff eventually. But the fact that we, as a, a society, place credibility and place value on certain people's experiences versus other people, where there's nothing wrong with growing up in the suburb, there's nothing wrong with growing up with two parents, there's nothing wrong with never having shot a gun or so selling drugs or doing drugs or having like a history of trauma, you know, that they they associate with the black community. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think that um, part of the, the conundrum within the community is that we placed so much emphasis on that to the point where people felt like they had to fall within that. And then again, people outside of the community, other black people seeing that and feeling like they needed to remove themselves so far away from that, that now it's become like a something that's so divisive within our community. So I, I feel like there's, I don't know if we'll ever be on the same page about this, but I do, I do think that we're at a point where we can't really dissociate it, which is why, you know, a lot of the immigrant, you know, parents would say, "Don't wear do rag, don't do this," because even though you know it's not associated with that, with with doing drugs or selling drugs or doing any of that stuff, there's no way to educate white people on the fact that you, that you're not the same. If they see you on the street, they're going to think that you're the same as this other person, regardless of whether or not you are. So at the end of the day, you have to make the decision as a parent or, or, you know, make that decision yourself, whether you're willing to take that risk, because you just can't sit and educate everyone every time you, you want to go out wearing a certain outfit. Exactly. And, and I think that it's, in, it, it, is it right? No, right? Like, because any time you categorize a person uh, without knowing who they are, that, that's an issue, right? That is stereotype, whatever you want to call it. That's an issue. But it's also a reality. Is and then it's not a fair reality. But kind of going back to how my mother raised me, the world doesn't care. <laughs> like that's like that's kind of like, and I, I understand the pressure that comes with that, the mental burden that comes with that. But on the flip side, the way that is being marketed, right? The way that is being monetized, the way that is being prom promoted and distributed globally. It has an impact on how um, how we are perceived. This is something that Elijah, and, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't be or shouldn't, but I'm just saying that I think the reality is, is that it does, whether whatever we want to do with that information. And Elijah was talking about that briefly, maybe not in this context, but he was saying how they were asking, um, Lamont asked, do we think that white people are having this same conversation? And he said, they're having a conversation, right? Um, but it's a different kind of conversation. And what he was basically saying is how a lot of white people, they are getting their understanding of blackness through the media, right? They're getting that through the media. Internationally, black, the, the, the immigrants, et cetera, they are getting their understanding of black people through the media. Publicly, you basically have to defend that version of blackness, right? Publicly, no matter what. So it's like, hey, if people are talking about this in songs, promoting this in songs, saying whatever in songs, the, the default must be there's nothing wrong with it. It's completely fine. Whether you agree with it or not, that's neither here nor there. But that has to be the no hypothesis. But what we have to also understand is what comes with that is in the situation where you have millions of white people where that is going to be where they get their understanding of blackness from millions of immigrants are going to be where they that's where they get their understanding of blackness from so then you have people who don't fall within that particular category where now a white person gets exposed to that person or an immigrant gets exposed to that person like you said and it's like oh wow you're the exception you're not the rule what i saw on television is the rule because i've been seeing that for years but you're the exception so so this is kind of like it, it's a hard thing where it, it creates a it creates a situation where we will never work towards a solution it's somewhat of a paradox now of course the easy counter that I'm sure many people are saying is, well, it wouldn't matter anyway, right? Even if we were perceived 
flawlessly in the media, white people would still be racist. White people would still treat us this way. Be, be, and that, that's probably valid as well. But I, 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 in this situation, I kind of go back to what my mother just ingrained in me is, well, are you perfect though? Are you perfect though? Is it fair? Absolutely not. Is it, is it a fair standard to put on us to always have to be an idea of perfect? No, but unfortunately, do I think it's like necessary for us to take that burden on? I hate to say it, but like, yeah, because I don't, I don't really know what other choice we have. Taking on the burden of? Of, of expecting perfection from ourselves. Yeah. Because that's, that, that's the only thing we can control. And, and I know it's not fair, but that's, it feels like, and, and I, you know, it, it gives me stress. Like the, the burden and the pressure that I put my, on myself as a black man, as a black professional, as a husband, as a homeowner, as, as an entrepreneur, like this standard of like, even with this business where I'm like looking at it and I'm always like thinking in and out, in and out. And then it's like, if this fails, it's your fault. It's your fault because you weren't good enough. You weren't good enough right now, no matter what. And then it's like, what more could I have done? Oh, I there are times when I sleep a little bit extra long, a little bit long because I'm so exhausted. And I'm like, damn, like, yo, I, I could have gotten three hours extra of work this week, <laughs> you know? But I got three hours extra of sleep this week. And that that's the pressure that sometimes as a black person, to have that pressure of always having to think like what more could I have done it's a lot and I, I don't want us to feel defeated because we feel like it's too much for us to handle because we don't have a choice like we can't buckle under the pressure we just have to take it on which sucks I mean I I think that at the end of the day as much as we hate the idea of this we are representing we talk about this all the time like the idea that you know if something, if you see some white person freak out on a plane, right? We joke, we call them Karens and Bobs and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, other white people could also joke about those those people because they don't associate themselves as as um, as this person, right? They don't take any ownership over what this person is doing. Anytime there's like a mass shooting and it happens to be a white person, they're not claiming this as like, oh my God, this is this is us. Um, but at the same time, we don't have that luxury, something we say all the time, is we see something happen on TV and it's a black, like I'm always cringing, like, damn, please, please, please don't be black, please don't be black. Like, I feel like we feel the weight of anytime anything goes wrong and it happens to be one of us. So at the end of the day, regardless of whether we like it or not, we do sort of have a responsibility because we do represent, whether we want to or not, we do represent black people as a whole to many other people like some you know some people i work with I'm, I'm usually one of few if not the only one on on my team or in my uh company or within our department whatever the case may be there's never really a lot of people um that look like me in that in that role so i feel like i i personally feel responsible for how i present myself because regardless of the fact that we know we're not a monolith and that they're so different, everyone is so different within our community, people are looking at me and judging all of us based on how they see me present myself. So like, I can't be that person that's feeding into the stereotype. I always, as I said, I'm always hyper aware of what volume I'm speaking at. And I feel like I have to actively work to make sure that that's not present in 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 meetings or around other people. Cause I don't want people judging me or thinking I'm like this angry black woman. So I feel like I'm hyper aware and hyper vigilant in my own actions because I feel like people are judging me as a representation, like either feeding into, you know, what they believe black people are like in general. Um, but I also, know and recognize that there's a privilege in people thinking you're the exception and i think that that's also when we talk about the idea of like race and racism i feel like that's a form of, of racism the fact that we don't other people don't necessarily 
they'll see you as an exception as opposed to the standard. Like they cannot get past the idea that other people like you exist. And I think that's a dangerous space to get into. Uh, nobody should be proud for somebody to tell you, no, you're so articulate or, you know, when they talk about colorism and the idea that somebody can say, oh, you're pretty for a black girl or for a darker skin girl or any of those things, those aren't compliments. And somebody to say that to me, even if it didn't apply to me in that space, I'd still be offended because I'm a black woman at the end of the day. So I take offense if you were to say any of these things, regardless of whether I am an exception to being ratchet or an exception to being the acceptable Negro. Like it's still offensive to me because you're, you're saying it as if we don't exist on a spectrum and, and that we're only a certain way. Right. So I, I just feel like it's something that we have to actively work to, to combat, but it's not something that I think that we're going to change. Yeah. But I also think it, it and it's also something that we, we can't get tired of doing. And I think it's kind of interesting that once again, rest is a luxury uh, that we don't have. But I think what when we start talking about the idea of like educating uh, non-black people and taking the effort to you know, give extra thought to how we approach things and how we think about things, a lot of black people are like, man, I'm, I'm just too tired. I'm too tired and I'm like, I feel you. Like it is exhausting, right? Like dealing with that pressure is exhausting. But if you give up, like, are you not gonna wake up tomorrow? Like, yes, you still have to wake up tomorrow. So you don't have the luxury of quitting. Or a lot of people might say, hey, like I should be able to do X, Y, and Z. And then it's kind of like, yeah, but understand we're still, we're still fighting this battle collectively. Um, and I always say collectively, and I understand that as a first generation, my, my experience may have been a little bit different um, and, and unique in a lot of ways, um, So, but we just can't get tired. Um, another thing that was interesting that um, Harana spoke about was her experiences were not necessarily, and her conversations were not necessarily rooted as much in racism, as much as as much as it was towards like xenophobia, um, and and that, I think that that's something really interesting as well. Talking on the idea of like um, immigrants, where recently, uh, actually, I spoke with one of my aunts, and uh, so something that something about Haitians. I don't know if it's like all immigrant groups, but a lot of Haitians. It's almost like they they they're so hesitant to tell you about like their history it's like sometimes like me and my cousins were like yo why what, what are y'all hiding <laughs> right? like why don't y'all talk and it, it's like a joke because it's, it's almost like the energy they give you is like why are you talking about yesterday that was that was yesterday <laughs> like don't worry about that right and so that it was like one of those things where you have to really actively ask intentional questions and if you don't ask the exact question then you're not going to get the exact answer so i don't know if that's your experience as immigrants but i would love to know if, if y'all have that experience as well where you can't get anything out of your like that generation but um i, I was speaking to her and uh, she's one of the aunts that would actually tell you uh stuff so i was like yeah asking her about her experiences when she immigrated over here and if she experienced racism and what she said was because she moved into a predominantly black area she didn't necessarily receive racism from white people but she actually got a lot of it from black americans who were just constantly making fun of her she was saying that like uh, we're talking about um the the clothes that she would wear her accent the food that she was eating like you name it um she she was just getting made fun of uh, penny also speaks about it and harana spoke about it in that where i think um uh, Lamont was Lamont said uh, like African booty scratcher. That was the thing that they would they would call it. And I remember growing up as a Haitian, we got to the point where me as a, as a young Haitian, me and my Haitian friends would also make fun of Haitians, right? Like, and that was like a thing amongst ourselves. And it's like, where did we get that from? These are people that went through a really hard journey to come over here to try to make a better life, and then now we're making fun of the way that our aunts and uncles and grandparents and pastors sound when they when they're speaking english so that was something that happened as well so it's it's interesting because on one side like there's this there's this tension that i i think and 
and I'm happy that I think is going away, but there's this tension where you have a lot of black Americans that would feel, um, and we're talking about this because they spoke about the episode, you have a lot of black Americans that would feel that immigrants would, would feel like they are better than them. So there's that. And Penny and Harana validated that experience. But then on the flip side, you have a lot of black Americans who are who have been making fun of immigrants coming here and like in my aunt's situation she used the word like bullying her and her sisters so both of those experiences have existed historically so i wonder how much that also plays into because now you have to think if in theory, if you're an immigrant, you come over here, that's your experience, you're getting made fun of, et cetera. Word is gonna get back to Haiti, right? Like, what are the things that you have to look out for when you're coming to America? It's like, oh, FYI, these, these people, sorry to say these people, but like, that's what they might say. These people, they're not gonna accept us, right? And then it creates more tension. Okay, so, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about was, have you had the opportunity to have that conversation with people that are coming up behind you? Um, you know, I'll echo what, what Jeff was saying. I think Karana mentioned it too with mentees, especially going into uh, like into corporate. There's just certain things that there's certain politics that you just have to be aware of. And some of the, one of the things that I have to remind people, because I feel like the younger generations are really active in ways that we never were. Like they're at a point now where, you know, they pick companies based on company values. Like what is this company contributing? Does this feed into my my lifestyle and the personal choices I make at home. Like, do I feel like I could be, this is a place that I would be proud to work at. They ask these things, you know, during their interview process, they ask about the culture, the work culture, um, what the company is doing. So they're really bright and insightful. And I, you know, I admire that about them. But at the same time, I feel like there's, there can sometimes be a sense of optimism like overly optimistic to an extent that we're in a day and age that you can bring your full self to work and that's just not the case at the end of the day you can you can do whatever you want but also know that there are people who are judging you based on that whether you deserve it or not whether you want it or not and i feel like we talk about the idea of kids and what would be you know, what would we say to our kids? How would we raise them? Would we do anything differently than our, you know, our parents' generation did? And it's sad to say, I don't think so. I, I think that I would be in the same boat telling my kid the same thing because as the, despite how far we think we came, we really haven't gone very far. Nothing's really changed. So my kid, I'm gonna be having that same conversation with them um, when they're of age and making sure that they're avoiding certain things and presenting themselves a certain way because at the end of the day, like things just have not changed. Yeah. And in Insecure, um, I remember one of the episodes was actually Molly, uh, right? In her law firm, there was another black girl that came and was part of her law firm. And the way that she was talking, she was talking a certain type of way. And she was, she was just like, you know, acting out. And Molly being like a black woman that was like, hey, I know what the game is. Let me, let me try to help you. Let me try to counsel you. Let me try to direct you about what this race thing in corporate looks like. And she went up to this girl and was like trying to explain to her and the girl just completely rejected that feedback. She was like, well, I got to where I am being how I am. Thanks, but no thanks. And then I think later on in the episode, um, her, Molly's white boss came up to her and was like, hey, could you talk with such and such? And Molly was basically like, I'm good. Can somebody else have that talk? And because she already tried to do that and then now when she walked by the office, like there was this black girl that was having this conversation with like in, in a room with a bunch of like white people having a conversation and her and Molly caught eyes. And it was kind of like a symbol of Molly was acknowledging like, I see you, I know the position that you're in. You see me and you know that I told you so, right? I can tell you that I've had that experience 
at, um, you know, at when I was early on in my career and I felt like I was powerless in the sense that I'm not at a level where I can really pull you up to a certain extent. I can only give you my opinion. You know, I think I was a, a coordinator at the time. They brought on a new, um, a new assistant. She was like a design assistant. Um, and she was a little rough around the edges, <laughs> you know, I, I will say. And so I tried to have a conversation with her because I could understand where she was coming from. I know, you know, growing up with, with, with family, that's very, you know, different. Some people are completely different than I, you know, I am in my family. We're all very diverse. I've experienced this. I know like she's, this is, this, this is just a, a, a black girl expressing herself, right? Like having fun or being sarcastic. I think part of it was like, she was very sarcastic. And um, I remember, you know, one of the, the head of the design team, I was actually pretty cool with, and they had brought her on and I was happy to see another black girl, but I was also very nervous because having the conversations with her, I'm like, okay, um, hopefully she knows how to rein it in when it matters. And she's not like projecting the sarcasm all the time. Some people might not understand her humor and they might take it the wrong way. Nothing changed. I remember I had a conversation with her with her boss and her boss was just like complaining about her you know like she's rude she gives me attitude if i tell her to change something she'll make like a snarky comment and um so i went back to this girl i had like a private conversation with her and i was trying to just like molly like explain to her kind of how to play the game you know like maybe i get it i get you but i don't know if everybody else is going to take it that same way and same thing she didn't take that feedback. And when I tell you maybe like three weeks later, she was gone, she got fired. And I feel like that's the part that sucks is that we do have a game essentially that we have to, to play, like to survive, especially in, in the corporate world, There, we cannot be fully authentic to an extent. And um, it's just, it sucks that we have to be those people to like self police, but you just, you just do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to kind of move towards rapping, the way I the way I view this this life thing, because the question ultimately was like having a conversation with people that are behind you. Uh, I for me in in life, it's very rare that you'll hear me say the word like should or shouldn't. Right. Like because should or shouldn't is just it, right or wrong. Is just not how my mother just embedded in me for years the, the to move away from the idea of a thing should has this extreme focus on the idea of a thing and not the reality of a thing so my mother would just like be focused on the reality so with that i i think that one thing right or wrong and i i don't i don't think anybody has the answers but is really focusing on the reality of our existence and how do we win within our reality that's my that's my focus is how are we going to win in the reality that we're facing not saying why are we losing in the reality and how the reality shouldn't be what it is because i will live my the rest of my life and die and still be talking, my kids and grandkids will still be talking about should and shouldn't instead of focusing on how do I win? What is it going to take to win? That could be wrong. That, that could be the wrong way to think about it. Maybe it is, and maybe in five years, I, you know, maybe somebody will comment on this and, and, and change my mind because I'm very flexible in terms of changing my perspective if somebody brings me a good argument. So there's that. When it comes to life, I view life as a relay race. And when my grandmother came from Haiti, she was behind in the race, right? Uh, she, she had the baton in her hand and she, she came and she was, she was going, she was going. And I think whether you're an immigrant or you were born here, I think everybody can probably associate with this analogy. So then that generation, our grandparents' generation, they handed the baton to our parents a little bit closer. They closed the gap a little bit. And then after they closed the gap a little bit, now they handed it to us, right? And 
we we got some juice, right? Like we we got a little bit of juice. Like they they came it up, and now it's like we're we're still behind, but we're we're kind of creeping up. And and my my entire focus of my life is two things: is one, how do I not lose the 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 progress that my mother made in that race, for one, two, how do I either bridge the gap or break even or move ahead of the next person in front of me? And then how do I hand the position off to the next generation with a fighting chance to not just win the race, but win it with ease, celebrating like Usain Bolt before they cross the line. That's my entire focus is just all in all the way. But part of that, and I don't know if it's the right thing is, I think it would be hard for me not to say that I'm going to probably raise our hope, if God blesses us with children, raise our kids that way, where it's focusing on 100% what's in your control. I'll probably give them a little bit more of an education on racial issues than my mother gave me but I will probably root that education in, but you still have no excuse to not be perfect. <laughs> so right or wrong, that's probably what I'm gonna do, but um, we'll hopefully we'll counter each other when that time comes and maybe good cop, bad cop sometimes, something like that, I don't know. That's a, that's a good place to wrap it up. Cool. Um, it was another good discussion. Hopefully you guys drop the comments. If you have any feedback, let us know what your experience was like growing up black in America. How did your parents see to you, talk to you about race? Um, let us know what you think. We will see you guys next week. I'm Darnell. And I'm Melissa. Peace.